So, we have heard from Gianluca how to process at the same time millions of cells. Uh, here we'll be dealing mostly with one cell at a time. So, <laughs> we are scaling down very much the, 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 the processing of the images. So, I'm, I'm a virologist. I'm, I'm head of the group of molecular virology here at SAGB in Trieste. And my main interest throughout my career since I was a student was to, to work with viruses. I worked with several different kinds of viruses, from herpes virus at the beginning, to HIV, to flavivirus more recently. And uh, so my interest is really in virology, and I have, you know, biological questions concerning virus-host interactions, virus-cell interactions that I would like to address with different tools. And, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the early 2000s, when Gianluca was here many years ago, <laughs> uh, we started to, to apply uh, GFP as a tool for our studies. <coughs> and GFP you know, is a very versatile protein. You've heard perhaps in previous talks how uh, GFP is an autofluorescent protein and is, is quite stable. And there are different variants of GFP that are uh, with different uh, spectral properties. So GFP would uh, emit in the green, uh, YFP would emit in the yellow, BFP will meet in the blue, ChiFP, so Chan FP will be in the Chan. So very nice different colors that allows you to tag uh, different uh, proteins in your cell and to so see different localization. Uh, this, this, uh, um, um, these tools expanded a lot uh, during the years because uh, you know GFP covers more or less uh, the um, blue, yellow, green, yellow part of the spectrum. Now, with the addition of all the red uh, shifted, uh, the red threatened pr proteins, you can cover all the rest of the spectrum. So you can really have a full range of, of uh, fluorescent proteins that covers really all the visible spectrum of, of the light. And you can really uh, use this toolbox to stain your, 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 your favorite proteins in, in the cell. Now, the um, the point I want to make is that you know, at the beginning we were using GFP to tag proteins, look at localizations in the cells, look at the interactions in the cells, and mostly in fixed cells. But of course, you know, we want to go uh, live and try to understand what was going on in, in, in real time in a living cell. Now these are you know, just cells that are stained with different variants of uh, autofluorescent proteins, and uh, these are histones that are tagged with either GFP or red fluorescent protein or Chan, and you can see <coughs> that here simply you can see the, the nucleus that divide uh, in, in during time in this, uh, in this uh, uh, time lapse. So it's a simple time lapse, doesn't tell you much that you didn't know before, but actually tells you that the cells are alive and they survive during this uh, acquisition and they divide, and you can calculate maybe uh, the localization of these uh, histones, which is in the nucleus, of course, and you can uh, eventually uh, understand a little bit uh, the description of, of this process. But really, as what David was saying this morning, uh, so you can use this uh, fluorescent proteins also to quantify processes in the cell. So we wanted really to go more into the quantification process, to get real numbers from, from what you observe in, in a cell, and in our case, in an infected cell. So we, we, uh, we started to, to play with uh, some techniques, uh, actually with the help of Paolo Maiuri, who will be talking tomorrow, but he joined the lab uh, also as a PhD student with a physics background. And so we started to play with uh, uh, these uh, uh, ways of perturbing the, 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 the living cell in order to try to derive uh, some uh, quanti quantitative measures of the processor that we were interested in. And uh, David already introduced FRAP. Uh, I don't know if you understood what FRAP is. So FRAP, I don't know, because it's, it's, it's sometimes it's, uh, it's complex to explain, because uh, you have a population of, of cells that are fluorescent, OK? And you bleach with a, a laser at the same wavelength of the emitting uh, out of fluorescent protein. But this and, and you switch them off. It doesn't mean you kill them or you destroy them. You just switch them off. So they are completely turned off. And then, in time, we look at the recovery of the signal in this uh, area of bleach. So it's like looking at a, a, you know, a ballroom in the dark, and everybody ha holds a candle, okay, and people are moving in the room or maybe sitting at the table. And then you blow from above. You just switch off some of the candles, so you have some area of dark, 
okay? And then depending what, what was in that area, if it's that somebody was sitting there, the recovery of fluorescence will be very, very slow. But if people were dancing in that area, so the, 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 the switched off candles will get out of the bleached area and the candles with the light will come in and the, the, the signal will be uh, recovered in the area of bleach. So this allows you to uh, derive some uh, quantity information about the, uh, um, the, the diffusion coefficient, so how the, the mo molecules can travel within the cell, either the nucleus or the cytoplasm or the compartment you're looking at, and how is these um, molecules bind to their uh, binding sites. And there are different varieties of FRAP. So one is to bleach an area and look at the recovery within this area, and you look at this curve here as a recovery curve. Another op possibility is to do flip, so first and loss in photobleaching. In this case, you bleach continuously one area, and you look at the depletion of the signal in the surrounding uh, environment of the cell. And you have, in this case, a, lo a loss of fluorescent curve. And then you have other techniques like photoactivation that you can activate and switch on the fluorescence of different uh, um, out of fluorescent proteins. So by using the, this, the technique, we, we, we wanted to a little bit uh, understand some of the kinetic of the process that we are interested in. And uh, one problem is that uh, GFP probably traditionally is used to tag proteins, okay? You can have uh, your favorite proteins tagged with GFP and look at its localization in, in the cell, and maybe you can use FRAP to look at the kinetic at uh, the diffusion coefficient of this protein in the cell and uh, how it binds a particular substrate uh, in, in, in the cell. However, uh, I was dealing with viruses and viruses usually introduce a genome, the genome in the cell. So I was interested also to tag not only proteins but also genomes and in particular, in particular RNA because at the time I was interested in HIV and then further on in other viruses that are RNA based. So my interest was to tag also genomes. And to tag RNA, uh, I, uh, there was this interesting uh, um, technology that uh, was originally uh, uh, proposed by Edouard Bertrand while working in Bob Singer lab in New York, which take advantage of the MS2 phage protein, which is a coat protein of a bacteriophage, which binds uh, avidly a specific uh, uh, hairpin of RNA. So the idea is that uh, uh, you can tag uh, uh, this uh, MS2 coat protein with uh, GFP or whatever autofluorescent protein you like and use this to bind these hairpins cloned into your, into your favorite RNA. Mm -hmm. By this way, you can actually track your RNA in a living cell. And this was kind of motivated from previous work done for, uh, for DNA where uh, other groups have shown that you can do the same for DNA by introducing these LAC uh, operator repeats and then fusing your LAC um, I with uh, an autofluorescent protein and then you can look at your DNA in the cell. So these are techniques that are, are uh, used to tag either DNA or RNA. And I want to show this image from a work of Spectre of some time ago because it's quite <coughs> nice. Uh, they constructed this, uh, this construct, it's completely artificial, <coughs> but actually proves the point. They cloned uh, 256 uh, repeats of the LAC operator into this, uh, uh, into this construct. Then they have a GFP um, uh, um, reporter with uh, the SKL, which is a, is a, is a target uh, for the lysosome in the cytoplasm. So when this protein is produced, we'll go into the cytoplasm and forms dots. And then they have cloned, within this RNA, an array of MS2 repeats, MS2 binding sites, that will be uh, bound by MS2 YFP with a nuclear localization site, okay? Quite a complex construct, but you know, this allows you to track both DNA and RNA at the same time. And actually, this is what actually happens. Here you have a cell. Uh, this spot here, Chan spot in the nucleus, would correspond to uh, this DNA tagged in vivo, so in the living cell. And the diffused green signal that you see here, it comes from uh, the diffused uh, MS2 YFP and LS in the nucleus. It's green, but green is something that can, you can, the color has been added, and in fact, is yellow fluorescent proteins. Um, 
what happens when you induce this, uh, um, this construct? So this is an inducible construct, and you can actually um, uh, induce uh, uh, transcription, and this is what happens. You know, in time, you have the formation of a spot here corresponding to the RNA at the transcription site, and of course, the GFP SKL protein will be in the cytoplasm. So you're here, you really, in, 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 in real time, in a living cell, you can monitor both, uh, the, in this case, also the chromatin at the level of the transcription site and the RNA, which is being transcribed, and the formation of the, tra uh, of the, uh, trans the traduced proteins, the translated protein. So is it a powerful technique that allows you to monitor these processes? I have to mention that this uh, technique uh, was not just transfecting this, uh, uh, you know, we, it was some time ago, there was no CRISP-Cas or other uh, strategies. Uh, the only way to introduce this console in the cell to have a, a clear signal was to um, transfect the construct and then amplify the construct locally. So these are actually tandem repeats, repeats of this construct at a specific chromatin location. And this is a peculiarity of specific cell lines that if you incubate with this construct and you select for some time, they would amplify the standard repeats at the specific location. So it makes it very easy to, um, to uh, look at a process uh, in time, to visualize this process. Our interest was in HIV. So HIV is a virus, as you all know, it's a retrovirus. It uh, uh, is an RNA virus that then uh, it converts its genome into DNA, and the DNA is then integrated in the target cell and we, we, did a, we were working a lot on transcription of HIV, and we were interested in different uh, either host or viral proteins that are involved in the transcription process of HIV. I won't go too much into the detail of this. This is part of the uh, basic work on transcription of HIV. The only one point I want to make is, first, that HIV integrates into the host chromatin. So it, it actually splices its own genome into, into chromatin, and from its own promoter, it assembles a transcription complex that then uh, recruits the, the polymerase that then slides, uh, then, then goes through the gene and uh, transcribes uh, the viral RNA. And that there are specific uh, viral proteins, like the viral protein TAT, which is a very powerful, let's call it booster of transcription. So TAT actually recruits several of these components to the transcription site and boosts elongation of the polymerase. So actually, apart from TAT, which is viral, all the other components are actually from the host. You have the host polymerase, you have the host uh, components of the transcription site. So in, 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 in general terms, this is a, a virus, but it's also very similar to what happens in any transcribed gene. Now, so we had uh, some clear ideas of what were the components of the system, but clearly, what we wanted to do is to observe what was happening at the integration site in uh, an infected cell. This is what was our target at the time. So first, we, we turned to the approach uh, that I've shown you before. We, we tagged <coughs> the virus with uh, the uh, MS2 repeats, so an array of MS2 binding site, 24 to be exact, into the genome of HIV. And we cloned uh, GFP-MS2 um, hybrid protein for tagging of the RNA. And we applied FRAP, as I've described you before, to this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, process. First, we did some validation, of course. This is, uh, of course, one, picular, uh, one, uh, one uh, uh, technical thing. Of course, I'm working with viruses. And viruses are you know, pathogenics for human. Uh, you don't want to have your microscope of the institute uh, working and people working with uh, HIV, uh, you know, uh, in the, 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 in the max of common use of the institute. So what we used, well, we used uh, uh, lentiviral vectors, so vectors that are derived from HIV and that we can be used more safely than using the full virus. So we cloned this MS2 into one of these <coughs> vectors that are perfectly responsive uh, from the viral promoter uh, in, the, in, pres in the presence of TAT, they would transcribe this uh, uh, hybrid RNA and produce the MS2 uh, um, repeats. And you can see here that you, know, you have the cell, you have a spot. These are in situ hybridization validation 
They say fix says we just use uh, um, DNA probes to uh, to prove to prove that actually RNA and was corresponding to the DNA of the virus at a specific location in the cells that polymerase 2 was recruited at this uh, RNA during transcription as well as <coughs> Uh, TAT, which is the viral protein, uh, as well as other uh, cellular proteins like CDK9 or cyclin T1. So this is a validation that tells you that this cell line carrying, in this case, tandem repeats. So it's the same concept as I've shown you before. We introduce repeats of this construct within uh, the nucleus of a cell. And, uh, and that, that's reproducing transcription activation of HIV in, in the context of uh, uh, a cell nucleus. And then we turn to uh, to FRAP to uh, look at the uh, recovery of the signal. And this, uh, you can see this is the nucleus, and this is the spot corresponding to the, um, the tandem array. Uh, and you can see here the bleaching and the recovery. I hope you saw it, uh, that the spot was bleached and then the recovery. And these are the, were the recovery curves that were derived from, uh, from these data, as you can see. And from these recovery curves, you could determine uh, the, um, um, the, the, the velocity of the uh, polymerase on the, uh, on the transcription site of the, uh, of the uh, tandem array. And the calculation of the elongation rate of the polymerase were, were at around 2 kilo bi kilo, kilo bi sorry, kilobases per minute. OK, so this is a, it's actually a quanti quantitative uh, output of our analysis. Uh, however, we were not, I was not satisfied, probably Paolo was satisfied because, you know, from a physicist point of view, is, is, it was a, an achievement, uh, but from a, a, a virologist point of view, it was not real. So we had tandem arrays or constructs. It's something that I don't, didn't really like. What I want to have is an integrated genome, a single genome per cell integrated a specific locus in the, in the chromatin, okay? Like looking at a single gene, for example. So we spent some time deriving, a, 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 again, a vector. So again, a vector with the uh, repeats of MS2, carrying also a reporter, in this case, again, as before, the GFP with the SKL targeting signal, and uh, uh, herpes virus tamatin kinase, this was used for doing the selection protocol. And what we did, we, uh, you, we packaged this construct into a virion-like particle, transduced cells, so we completely mimicked this, the, the integration process of a virus, of HIV, and then we selected the cells, okay, <coughs> that were carrying this integrated construct and that were uh, inducible by the uh, TAT uh, transcription uh, factor. And by doing this, it was a long process of selection and validation of these cell lines. We ended up with uh, 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 this cell, for example, that shows you a yellow nucleus because you transfected the MS2 tagged with YFP. And you can see that in the presence of TAT, you have a spot, a bright spot, and this corresponds because uh, we did the analysis to a single integration site. Okay, so these are not tandem arrays. This is a really a single integration site into chromatin. We map the chromatin location. We know it's a single integration site, and we have different cells with different integration sites in the chromatin. And uh, so having set the system, and this is a, is a validation of the system again, if, again, you have colocalization with different polymerase and different factors. If you treat with inhibitors <coughs> of transcription, you completely abolish the formation of these spots. So we had all the uh, validation of our system in place. Then, of course, we want to look this in, in time. And the first thing, we looked at the, uh, a time course of the spot uh, intensity in the in time. And this seems trivial, so you, do, you have a flat line basically, so you do, don't have variation of intensity of the spot in time. So this seems trivial, but in fact, in the field of transcription, there's a lot of debate about what are called bursts of transcription or, or transcriptional pulses. So transcription actually fluctu fluctuates up and down in a single gene in most of the cases. However, here, 
we have something different from a normal situation. We have an excess of the TAP transactivator, which is a potent booster of transcription, and this probably overcomes the uh, appearance of pulses and, and, and bursts. Okay, so having said this, uh, we, uh, we, we looked at the number of polymerases that were present on the, on, the, on the spot. And this is another quantitative analysis that we did not with uh, FRAP, but with uh, in situ hybridization, quantitative in situ hybridization, quantified the number of uh, nascent RNAs at the uh, transcription site. And by this, we could uh, estimate that uh, uh, at this particular site, there were around 20 uh, nascent RNAs corresponding to 20 RNA polymerases uh, that we assume equally spaced at 270 base pairs one to each other, which corresponds more or less at the spacing of uh, uh, um, a ribosomal gene which is being transcribed by pole one So this is another quantitative measure, the number of the polymerases at the transcription site. And then we move to FRAP. Okay, so again, this is the FRAP uh, movie. You can see pre-bleaching, bleaching, post-bleaching, post and the time course. And here is the, uh, the, is the, is the movie. Uh, I love it all the time I see it because the bleaching is, is very nice and also extremely quick. You know, a few seconds, you have bleaching and recovery. <coughs> and this, you know, we were quite surprised because compared to tandem arrays, the recovery was much quicker. And this is the right comparison of the same constructs in two different settings. So if you look at tandem arrays, this is the kinetic of the recovery. If you look at single integration, this is the kinetic of the recovery. So it takes much, much less time to recover from a single integration than to a tandem array. And this is reproducible. These are different integration sites from different cells that we uh, obtained. And the recovery is all more or less always uh, quick. Okay, so it appears there is a big difference in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the velocity of the polymerase in the two settings. And this is what's quite strange, but we made a quick calculation just by dividing the gene length for the frac recovery time. And you know, this is the same constructs, the same size. One takes four seconds on average, the other one takes around the 300 seconds. You can immediately appreciate the difference in the uh, rate of transcription between these two situations. But this is a very rough calculation, and we want to be more precise about this calculation. And here comes in also the help of David in, 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 uh, uh, on the interpretation of this uh, uh, recovery uh, FRAP analysis, because here is not only recovery, uh, analysis of FRAP recovery of molecules that diffuse within the area of bleach, you have also binding sites, and this has been a lady model. But these binding sites would grow in time because, of course, there is, there is continuous transcription of the binding site by the polymerase. So this was a quite a complex uh, uh, way to interpret a FRAP recovery curve. And uh, here I must say that uh, uh, Paolo did uh, uh, most of the work. Uh, he started to, to establish some uh, kinetic uh, uh, important parameter that he needed for the assay. One was the diffusion coefficient of the of the of the of MS2 within the area of bleach, and uh, and then also the, uh, the 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 processing time of the RNA because you have to imagine that polymerase transcribe the RNA on the gene and then the RNA is somehow released from this uh, transcription site. So he wanted to calculate this, and he did this by IFRAP, which is another alternative way of doing FRAP, where you actually bleach everything else but the spot. So the spot is the only part which is not bleached, so this immediately, the, the fluorescence will decrease because of the processing of the RNA at the spot, and then you will find, will, you can extrapolate the uh, processing time. And by Interpreting this parameter, he also developed uh, a simulation called Tran wave, where he assumed that each polymer is traveling along the gene corresponded to um, a peak of a wave, of a traveling wave. And by this, I won't go into the details also because it would be difficult for me to explain it carefully, but he could manage, to, he could model the uh, transcription, making some assumptions, of course, that all polymers have the same rate the polymerases are equidistant and the binding is, is, is instantaneous. These are assumptions for, for the model. And by this, he could actually uh, um, derive uh, the, um, 
the rate of the polymerase which fits the recovery curve at 50 kilobase per minute. Okay, uh, when we sent this paper for review, it was a tough review, and one of the things the reviewer asked was, okay, you have showed me a rate based on your tram wave model, which is very nice. Well, I didn't say that, actually. <laughs> but uh, uh, prove me in a different way uh, that you have the same kind of uh, kinetics. So we kind of uh, thought of how to do it. And uh, we used this, this thing. We, we calculated the number of RNAs by in situ by um, acquiring uh, the, and counting the RNA in the cell, and then to have the number of total RNAs. And then we look at the decay of the RNA in the cell by uh, doing an RT-PCR and by blocking a transcription, looking at the decay of the RNA. And with these two parameters, we could uh, uh, actually ex calculate a rough estimate of the RNA polymerase rate at, uh, again, between 10 and 30 kilobase per minute, which is also in the range of what we have um, modeled before. And so, uh, which was completely uh, different from everybody else. So this is a table at the time, I haven't reviewed it recently, but at the time, these are where the estimates of the polymerase of the, trans of the elongation rate of the polymers in different models, in different systems, and also other people have used uh, artificial tandem arrays, and also they had this estimate of the polymers rate like we had in our tandem arrays, but nobody has shown such a high speed of the polymerase. And this, uh, this the, the, the people <coughs> from AMBO actually, they produced this cover, which is a, is a, is a, um, a speed trap you know, of all the polymerase uh, caught while uh, uh, traveling at high speed. Probably because we were Italian, they thought it was a good idea to produce a cover like this. <laughs> uh, then, uh, I mean, this part of the work was really uh, done by Paolo with the help of Anna and Alex, and with the help of Davide while working with Jim McNally at NIH. Now, uh, I will turn now to another family of viruses, because my interest, again, is virology. That's we, we went deep into transcription, really, but I want to go back to viruses. And I'm now interested in, in uh, a lot in flaviviruses that are uh, very important worldwide. You have, of course, uh, flaviviruses like dengue virus, yellow fever virus, West Nile. More recently, uh, Zika virus is also a flavivirus. And uh, in the area here, we have uh, tick-borne encephalitis virus. And here is me jogging in this uh, cars area. You can get ticks over here, and we found also infected ticks, and there have been cases of uh, uh, tick borne encephalitis transmission in the area here. So it's something endemic in the area of Trieste, uh, let's say Austria, Slo Slovenia, and all Central and Eastern Europe. And, but the f let's say we use tick borne as a model of the family because the, 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 these viruses tend to have the same kind of uh, uh, replication cycle. This uh, virus infect the cell, and then they have a positive strand RNA genome. Okay, this positive strand RNA genome never reached the nucleus, but is actually uh, uh, um, uh, tra uh, translated uh, uh, on the membranes of the ER, and uh, the replication complex is assembled, produces a negative strand RNA that is used as a template for the positive strand RNA and then you have replication of the, uh, the viral genome. And then it assembles in the R and is uh, then <coughs> released in the medium. So it's a different system, uh, completely different virus from HIV, it never reaches the nucleus, everything happens in the cytoplasm. <coughs> we wanted to, uh, if we could, uh, uh, how, how we approach the study of this virus. So first we did some uh, uh, classical immunofluorescence, and you can see clearly here that um, uh, these are viral proteins that are uh, all in the, in, the, in the cytoplasm around the nucleus. And this is double strand RNA, and which uh, stains the replication uh, complexes of the replication site of the virus in the cytoplasm. Uh, this is another viral protein in this one. Uh, and this is a marker of DR, for example, showing that uh, you have a colocalization of viral protein with DR. However, this is nice, it's immunofluorescence, confocal, colocalization, whatever you like it, but is at low resolution. So we don't know what is going on at higher, at higher resolution. 
So to go higher at higher resolution, we didn't have the super resolution. We, uh, we applied uh, electron microscopy, and uh, actually um, tomography, to look at the um, uh, ultra structure of these uh, uh, um, cytoplasmic uh, membranes uh, following infection. And this is a, a, a tomographic reconstruction of what happens in, in the infected cells. These are infected cells with tick-borne encephalitis virus. And this is a, is a, a 3D reconstruction of an electron tomography. You have the membranes of the R in, 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 uh, in yellow. You have the viruses in red. And then you have these uh, 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 structures, these vesicles, that are clearly shown here, which are formed as invagination of the ER. And if you look at this uh, picture in, in more detail, you can see that these vesicles are actually connected to the cytoplasm <coughs> by small pores. Um, Within these uh, vesicles, you have uh, components of the viru virus, uh, the replication complex of the virus, as well as the um, RNA of the virus shown here. So these are actually the replication factories of the virus where the virus is replicating. Uh, and this is typical of the family. So you have different members of this family showing the same kind of uh, 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 structures in the uh, ER membranes. Now, OK, we have uh, um, a fixed image of what happens in the infected cells. We know how the membranes are modified. We can reconstruct these structures. But we don't have an idea of the dynamic of the process within these areas of the cytoplasm. And therefore, we again turn to our technology by MS2 tagging to look at the viral RNA into the infected cells. Again, it's not the infected cell, it is, again, a vector. So it's a, it's a full genome of the virus without the, M, the E and M proteins, which are the proteins that form the virion, so it's not infectious. So if you take this RNA and you clone <coughs> MS2 repeats in the non-coding region in the, uh, in the three prime end of the, of the uh, viral RNA, you can actually track the viral RNA in the, in, uh, in the cell. And these are cells that have been uh, transfected with this RNA. And in time, this will replicate and produce new positive strand RNA that is then you know, clustering in the cytoplasm of the cell. So <coughs> and by this way, we can actually track the viral RNA which is being replicated in the cell. I mean, it's been replicated. It's not that I'm introducing the RNA tagged. I'm introducing the RNA as a naked RNA. This would then be um, uh, translated and replicated in the infected cell. And the replicated RNA will have the binding site of MS2. And if MS2 is present in the cell, will bind these binding sites. And uh, you can stain the, the viral RNA. OK. so. This is the system. Uh, we uh, proved that by electron microscopy that the, this RNA with the MS2 bound to it is not within the vesicles, but outside of the vesicles. So in the vesicle, you have the replication of the RNA. Then the RNA is extruded from the vesicle, and there it binds to the MS2 uh, tag. and uh, Again, we applied uh, FRAP to the system to try to understand what is the dynamic of this RNA in the cell that uh, replicates these uh, uh, viral RNAs. Uh, FRAP, I already told you. FLIP, I already told you. These are the two techniques that, that we have been using. So first, we applied FRAP. Okay? So these are cells that are uh, showing uh, viral RNA in the cytoplasm. And if you look at the FRAP, in this case, you can see that the, the area of bleach persists for longer than before. Okay? And in fact, if you look at the recovery curves of uh, the protein, so if you do it uh, uh, at time zero, the recovery is fast. But as soon as the virus, the, the viral RNA starts replicating to the cells, you have always uh, um, slower and slower recovery curves of the FRAP signal. So there are three possibilities here. 
uh, that the viral RNA is, is not uh, replicated or very slowly replicated, the viral RNA is not accessible to the YFP, or that the viral RNA is slowly released from the compartments. And these are you know, how we interpret the FRAP data. So we turn to FLIP to look at the release of the, um, sorry, uh, yeah. The first thing is that basically the, the mobility of the GFP is not affected. And this is a, is a control, but I won't go into the details of this. I want to, go to focus on this aspect. That is that uh, uh, we applied FLIP to the system. So in this case, this is again an, a cell with the uh, stained RNA in the cytoplasm. In this case, we bleach over here continuously, and we look at the depletion of fluorescence outside of the area where the, virus, the, the viral RNA is replicated and within the area where the viral RNA is replicated. And if you do the, the flip experiment in this case, you, you clearly observe that there is a quick depletion of the signal outside of the compartments of uh, viral RNA replication, but within the compartment, the depletion is very, uh, very slow, meaning that is actually not uh, released uh, from these compartments. Further on, more, we looked uh, again uh, at a flip experiment, and this time we bleach within the compartments. Here, this would be the area of bleach, the red circle, and you can clearly see this is another area of the, uh, which is a distal area from the same uh, compartment in the same cell. And you can see that, <coughs> this is quite amazing, if you bleach in this area, you can clearly see a depletion of the signal around this area, but not further on, meaning that uh, the, there are physical uh, um, co constraints uh, in, in different compartments of the same area of the uh, cell where the viral RNA is being replicated. So to cut a long story, uh, story short, we could derive a model of uh, uh, tick-borne encephalitis replication in infected cell where you have the formation of these vesicles, where you have the replication of the RNA and the formation of the double strand RNA and the, the positive strand RNA will then be uh, extruded in an area which we call the extravesicular area that is uh, shown here by electron microscopy. It's, it's this area here, this is the vesicle. And in this area, you have the RNA of the virus, which undergoes a kind of triage. Either it's being translated again and form again other replication complexes, or can be, um, uh, so it can be translated, can be replicated, can be in, in packaged into new, uh, newly formed virions. And this area is the one that we have shown by the bleaching, and uh, we can measure the kinetic of the RNA uh, of, this, uh, of this particular virus. So this uh, part of the work was mostly done by Lisa Murin, who's now in New York. Paolo, give a lot of help again for the analysis of the FRAP. Anna, Melina, and other people in the lab. Electron microscopy was done in collaboration with Ralph Bartenschlagen and Ines uh, Romero Bray at uh, Heidelberg. So really, I want to thank you all for, for your attention. These are people of my group nowadays. This was a race last year. And this is part of the group. And there's a lot of people that joined the group in the past. And I'm grateful to all of them for, for their uh, contribution to our work. Thank you very much.